This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Suspect arrested in DRC's Beni area after three bomb blasts over the weekend. South Africa reimposes restrictions to contain fast-spreading Delta variant of COVID-19. And the U.S. says it's carried out another round of airstrikes against Iraqi forces, countering ISIL in Iraq and Syria. Hello and thank you for joining us on Africa Live. I am Penina Karibe. Also coming up this hour... Tanzanian president hits at adopting cryptocurrencies to drive economy. And in sports, action-packed safari rally weekend sees Sebastian Ogier emerge victorious. We begin in Somalia, where an estimated 30 people died when members of the Al-Shabaab militant group launched an attack in the semi-autonomous state of Galmudug on Sunday. A security official said the insurgents used car bombs in the assault on a military base in Whistle Town in central Somalia. The attack triggered a fight with government troops and armed civilians. The security official confirmed 17 soldiers and 13 civilians were among the dead. The Somali government has condemned the attack, saying 41 insurgents had been killed in the fighting. Al-Shabaab has since claimed responsibility for the attack. Let's go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where authorities say one suspect has been arrested after three bomb attacks hit the city of Beni in North Kivu province over the weekend. The government is also promising thorough investigations into the incident. On Sunday, two women were injured when a bomb exploded in a Catholic church. Police said a makeshift bomb had been placed inside the church ahead of a confirmation ceremony. The attack marks the first time a church has been targeted in the region that is under a state of siege. Later in the evening, a suicide bomb blew himself up in the outskirts of Beni, killing himself and injuring two other people. A day earlier, a bomb went off near a petrol station, but no injuries nor damages were reported. Eastern DRC has been facing security challenges, which have largely been blamed on Ugandan rebel group, the Allied Democratic Forces. Beni's vicar general, Loros Sondira, says the latest attacks could be a bad sign of what lies ahead for locals. This is already a bad sign that not only could the church be targeted, but also all public places. So it's a start and it alerts us to be careful. We don't know who did this or what it was about, but it was certainly to do harm. Unfortunately, we were lucky that there were only two people inside. We don't know their health status yet, but they are doing okay. But the goal was to target a large crowd. Let's cross over to the DRC. Our correspondent, Chris Ochamringa, joins us live from Kinshasa. Chris, what is the latest on those two bomb attacks on the weekend? Well, the military governor of Beni says they ha he has imposed a, a curfew in, uh, in the region after these attacks and uh, they have banned uh, large gatherings, markets, schools, churches and mosques are all closed because uh, he said that they have information that the people who carried out these attacks are planning to carry out other bomb blasts. They were three in just a space of two days. One happened on Saturday and two happened on Sunday. There was one that uh, you mentioned earlier, was a, a bomb was lobbed inside a church. Two women were very badly injured. And the other one, uh, eyewitnesses say, was a suicide bomber uh, who uh, blew himself up outside a bar in Beni. The authorities are saying that they're investigating and they've got some leads of who could have carried it out. Penina? Yeah, but this is all new, Chris, for the DRC, such bomb attacks. How are the authorities and the residents reacting to these latest developments? That's right, uh, Penina. This, uh, most of the attacks that have been carried out in uh, the Beni region have been, uh, you know, uh, by rebel groups who use machetes, guns, and sometimes burn people's houses. So this is uh, indeed a new, a new thing in the region. And uh, the government says that they are, they are very determined to ensure that they end the rebel activity in this region because there are experts from the UN who have said that uh, there is an Islamic uh, rebel group that's originally from Uganda known as the Allied Democratic Forces that has been carrying out these attacks in Beni. They say there are more than a thousand people who have been killed in that region since 2019. Now the government says they have already deployed uh, troops to the area. Last week they deployed a number of troops to beef up 
the, the military governor who's on the ground trying to ensure that this area is uh, gotten rid of, of all the rebels in the area. The people in the area are very worried because uh, they are fearing to go out in large gatherings. They are saying this is something new. They might, you know, be, uh, be killed by these bombs. And so many of them are staying home as they monitor the situation. But the authorities are saying, I've urged, urged people to remain calm and that they will get to the bottom of this. Penny, no? Chris, we appreciate the update. Thank you very much. Chris Chamringa live in Kinshasa. Foreign ministers and officials from 60 countries are meeting in Rome today to discuss the growing threat of the Islamic State group in Africa. While IS has suffered territorial defeat in Syria and Iraq, the influence of the jihadist group is growing across the African continent in countries like Mozambique, the DRC, and the Sahel region of West Africa. Officials hope to come up with what they say is a coordinated and coherent plan to, to tackle ISIL. So let's bring in a security analyst. We have with us Willem L, Senior Training Coordinator at the Institute for Security Studies, joining us live via Zoom from Pretoria. Thank you very much, Willem, for your time. So concerns are growing that ISIL influence is thriving here in Africa. How does this influence manifest itself and what do you think is contributing to this growth? Uh, good morning to you. Yes, unfortunately so, uh, you know, these type of groups, they only thrive in conditions and where these conditions are viable for them to, uh, to, to thrive and to operate in. And unfortunately so, in Africa, it seems to me that, that we are really uh, prone to recreate these conditions where instability is and where people are marginalized, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to, for these groups to infiltrate them and then to, to prey on the on the dissent and the discontent with the, with the uh, local communities. We saw that they entered into uh, to do Libya, they became part of the, of the, of the fighting there. They u also used Libya as a base to, to uh, uh, infiltrate and to further work in the Sahel. We saw in Nigeria that uh, they actually attacked the Boko Haram uh, uh, faction and they actually claimed to have killed the leader of the Boko Haram uh, uh, faction in their infighting. And then also we see it also turned, uh, went down into to, uh, Central Africa, uh, where uh, you, you just mentioned the, the uh, attacks in Beni, uh, where the ADF, the, uh, they swore allegiance with this group. And then also uh, last year, the group in Mozambique uh, also uh, swore allegiance with ISIS. And they also claimed quite a few of the attacks. Right, so we've, we've got groups such as Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab that have been in the continent for quite some time. So how are these new groups managing to penetrate such groups in the continent or to make inroads in the continent while such groups as Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram have been here? Uh, in the first place, they got a lot of funding. Uh, we saw that during the tenure in Syria uh, and the war there, they managed to accumulate quite a lot of funds and that they can now disseminate to these people. They also accumulated a lot of experience in fighting with the allied forces there. And then now what they do is they are offering this money, they are offering, uh, uh, apart from the money, they are also offering the, the extreme doctrines to these people. And then they also uh, offer training to them and, and weaponry. All right, we appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time, William Els, joining us via Zoom from Pretoria. Now, the Tunisian Navy has rescued 178 migrants who were trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea from Libya. According to Tunisia's Defence Ministry, two bodies were also recovered during the operation off Tunisia's coast. The migrants are listed as hailing from Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, Cote d'Ivoire, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Mali and Ethiopia. Tunisian authorities intercepted the migrants who had set off from the Libyan port of Zuwara on Friday night. A day earlier, Tunisian authorities intercepted another 267 would-be migrants who had also begun the sea crossing from Libya. Red Crescent officials have warned that centers set up to house migrants in southern Tunisia were full. According to the International Organization for Migration, more than 1,000 migrants setting off from Libya have ended up in Tunisia since January. The World Health Organization says the Delta variant has been detected in at least 92 countries. It says it's by far the most transmissible of the variants identified. In Australia, the cities of Darwin and Sydney are in a new lockdown after detecting cases of the Delta variant. Sydney has reported 110 new cases, while Darwin has seen four. The state of New South Wales has reported 18 new cases. In Bangladesh, tens of thousands of migrant workers fled the capital Dhaka ahead of a 
tough lockdown. South Africa has tightened restrictions to combat a new surge in infections, which the government says is linked to the Delta variant. South Africa has also recorded nearly 19,000 new cases. Ethiopia's Electoral Commission is today expected to announce the preliminary results of parliamentary elections held on Monday last week. The polls were mar marred by an opposition boycott and reports of irregularities in some areas. However, observers from the African Union say the polls were conducted in a credible manner. The poll is considered the first test of voter support for Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, the, the elections, which could lead to the country's first democratic transfer of power, had been repeatedly delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Insecurity and logistical problems also prevented voting from taking place in some areas. So Jutian's Grim Chala is in Addis Ababa for us. He joins us for the latest on this preliminary results of last week's election. So, Girum, what's the latest on that? Penina, the National Electoral Board of Ethiopia has made few announcements based on the developments uh, that have been seen over the last uh, few days. So one of them is from 440 seats of the parliament, uh, more than half of them are now uh, announced uh, by them and confirmed. The results are confirmed and the rest of them are also pending uh, uh, to be announced perhaps in the coming uh, few days as well. Uh, the other most important issue that has been raised is the complaints by several parties are being addressed according to the National Electoral Board uh, and administrative um, decisions have, have also been made. Vote recountings are the ones to blame for most of the delays of uh, the results announcements, uh, according to them, and uh, work is now being ex expedited so that all general election results can be announced in the coming week or uh, so. So far, what we know uh, is this, Penina. All right, so talk to us about the progress on voting in some of the areas where voting had been delayed. As you know, the Tigray regional state, some areas in Somalia and Harare, regional states, uh, there were no elections held, uh, the sixth round of Ethiopian general elections, by the way. Uh, some of the areas, including Tigra, is insecurity, obviously, and some of the areas, uh, some other areas were also logistic and other related uh, problems. The Ethiopian National Electoral Board, again, uh, said that September is the time scheduled to hold the general uh, elections, uh, part of the general elections in these uh, regional states so far, uh, so, so, so that uh, the overall election results can also be added up uh, to this one. So they are saying that uh, September is the scheduled time and preparations are being made, uh, made according to plan. And so far, there are no uh, there are no delays expected in that regard. But the Tigray Regional State on its own is saying that, yes, insecurity is still a challenge uh, and the central government needs to support it so that it can manage uh, that election on time in September, that is. All right, Gurum, thank you for that update. Gurum Chala live in Addis Ababa. China and Russia have formally announced the extension of the Treaty of Good Neighborliness, Friendship and Cooperation between the two countries. During a video conference with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, on Monday afternoon, Chinese President Xi Jinping said the idea of lasting friendship enshrined in the treaty conforms to the fundamental interests of the two countries um, and conforms also to the theme of peace and development of the era and is a vivid practice of building a new type of international relations in a community with a shared future for mankind. She said he is confident that under the guidance of the spirit of the treaty, China and Russia will overcome difficulties and march ahead together. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a quick break. Coming up. Connecting special needs children to much needed therapy will tell you how an organization in Kenya is bridging the gap for the poor. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adam Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Syria, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice.
How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. I try to not let it affect me, but there are days when it does. I'm a human being, and to see patients in a hospital bed and their family members are not there, there's no one there to hold their hand, that that human touch, you know? says it's carried out another round of airstrikes against Iraqi forces countering ISIL in Iraq and Syria. The U.S. calls the troops Iranian-backed militias and says it was responding to drone attacks against U.S. personnel and facilities in Iraq. The American military said the strikes targeted operational and weapon storage sites. It gave no details of any casualties. Jagruti Davi has more from Washington, D.C. In a statement, the Pentagon Secretary, uh, Press Secretary John Kirby, said that the airstrikes were, continue, were, were conducted on facilities in the uh, Iraq-Syria border region um, and that they were designed to lim limit the risk of escalation but also to send a clear and unambiguous deterrent message. Um, the targets were in Iraq and Syria and that they were chosen because they were being used by Iran-backed militias that uh, the, that John Kirby said were engaged in unmanned aerial vehicle attacks against U.S. personnel and facilities. There were bases that were used by Iran-backed militia, say the U.S., uh, for storage and weapons uh, storage. So this is the second such strike conducted by the U.S. And I think um, this is a calculation that the United States is having to make. Um, there are some observers who say that the round of airstrikes in February, which was the first that was conducted, they weren't enough of a deterrent. Remember, in this statement, um, the Pentagon has said that they are uh, aimed at uh, merely being a deterrent. They are defensive attacks. That's the kind of language that's used. They're not uh, aimed at wanting to escalate the situation. Um, and that is clearly because uh, the United States has its eye on bringing Iran back to the table, back to the talks on the, on the nuclear deal. But of course, Iran and the United States are not talking directly. They are being mediated, these talks, by European uh, negotiators. So this is clearly adding fragility and complications to an already very delicate situation between the two countries. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China, Nigeria's Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, expressed congratulations to the Communist Party of China. In addition, he also spoke highly of the fruitful results of cooperation between China and Nigeria in various fields. He emphasized that Nigeria is proud of having good relations with China. On behalf of the federal government of Nigeria, I congratulate the CPC and the government of China. It's not a mean feat for a political party to exist for 100 years. For a political party in a country, anywhere in the world, to survive for 100 years, I think it must be celebrated. In the area of infrastructure in particular, we know that China has stretched its hands to pull us up. Uh, I think uh, the China government and China, Chinese companies have been quite um, uh, 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 very prominent in this. And whatever we can do 
to deepen infrastructure development, I think it should be continued and be encouraged. Chief Mukuni, a traditional leader in Zambia, has said that under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, China has ended absolute poverty, improved the living standards of the Chinese people, and promoted sustainable green development. He said China has so many amazing achievements which should be praised highly by the rest of the world. On behalf of Zambian people, I wish to extend my warmest congratulations to the Chinese leading party. CPC for its centenary anniversary and also to the remarkable major achievements that China has made under the leadership of CPC over the last hundred years. As far as I know, the fundamental changes have taken place in all around aspects in China like economic, social development, alleviation of absolute poverty, enhancement of the living standards of the Chinese people, sustainable and uh, green development, to name a few, especially in the China's international trade with the rest of the world and uh, its policy of reform and opening up. So I must say that the, those great achievements, accomplishments that Chinese people have made under the leadership of CPC must be applauded and congratulated by the rest of the world. The Communist Party of China has a long history of engagement to the African continent as countries and their leaders fought, fought for and attained independence and worked to ensure growth and development for their citizens. CGTN's Wilkis Chenyabo sat down with the CEO of the African Policy Institute for insights on China's engagement with the continent through pivotal points in their history. One would look at um, uh, CPC from different perspectives. One, as a rebellion party. Uh, two, as a post-independent development party. And three, as a party that has generally uh, taken part in shaping our global politics. African rebellion parties like uh, African National Congress in South Africa, uh, ZANU-PF in Zimbabwe, they would all earn uh, this part, these um, uh, skills from uh, the CPC. What skills am I talking about? The need to rehabilitate your people and give them dignity and the need to rehabilitate resources and use them for the development of your people. That's what tribalization amounts to. What we call the Beijing Consensus was a consensus about tribalization, about freedom, about non-hegemony, about the, 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 the unity of humanity. That is what we now call Beijing Consensus and I hope uh, the thinkers of Beijing Consensus are now involved in uh, adjusting this beautiful uh, rebellion of thought uh, to the realities of the post-Cold uh, War era. We have seen China's economic growth and this has spilled over into Africa and Africa is also now benefiting from this. Perhaps you can talk us through some of the highlights of this. Because of that clear-mindedness clear of the Chinese uh, political leadership, what we have had is long-term stability of China. From 1949 to date, the Communist Party is governing. It's going through the rhythms of life, looking at what change is coming and adjusting to that change. And as a result, China has been able to achieve things that no other country in the world has managed to achieve within such a short period. China has some resources that it can now use for the development of humanity. Now, if, you do, if a country like China, that is presiding over the world economy, does not invest those kind of resources, different parts of the world are left behind. And therefore, we are not moving as, as one uh, of what uh, President Xi Jinping calls, you know, a community of shared destiny for mankind. And that is where China has come out very strongly 
in order to invest some of its resources at affordable costs for the Africans. And therefore we can see the transformation of Kenya. Uh, let me not talk about Africa. My own Kenya, its liberation from 2000. What have we gotten? Look at the roads that we have here. Look at the railway from Mombasa now headed to uh, Kisumu and finally to Busia and all the way up to Uganda. And the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation has provided that think tank at the highest level possible and with the segmentation where elites like myself or the scholars and intellectuals are also involved in terms of giving ideas and thoughts about how the China-Africa Cooperation must be structured. Through Belt and uh, Road Initiative, we have also managed to, uh, to, to, to basically pump resources. Today, 40 African countries are taking part in that, 40 out of 55. And the number, I'm told, is growing. We are now reaching almost 43. The globalization of, Ch of China is based on this idea of greater unity of mankind, mm -hmm. building a community of shared destiny for all of us. And that destiny is prosperous, and that destiny is peaceful, and that destiny is full of dignity for all of us. Nobody would fight with that thought. Côte d'Ivoire's controversial former president, Laurent Gbagbo, received a hero's welcome when he visited his home village on Sunday. The 76-year-old Gbagbo was received by thousands of his supporters when he arrived in Mama. The village of Mama, located in the southwest of the West African country, has been a beehive of activity awaiting the return of Gbagbo. Gbagbo arrived in Côte d'Ivoire from Europe on June 18th after being acquitted of the crimes against humanity by the ICC. The charges had stemmed from violence that claimed around 3,000 lives after Gbagbo refused to concede electoral defeat in 2010. You're watching Africa Live, coming up in business news. Tanzanian president hints at adopting cryptocurrencies to drive the economy. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. The 
the South African government has once again placed a total prohibition on alcohol sales, a travel ban and an earlier curfew as the country struggles against a third wave of COVID-19 infections. South Africa on Sunday recorded over 15,000 new COVID-19 cases. CGTN's Yuli Sanjamela has more. This past weekend, the South African government confirmed that the highly infectious Delta variant of COVID-19 is behind the current surge in new cases in the country. The variant was first detected in India and is rapidly becoming the dominant one in South Africa. President Sir Ramaphosa has announced new restrictions in an effort to contain the massive surge in infections and relieve pressure on the health care sector. In a televised national address, the president confirmed that the Delta variant is fast spreading through the country. The evidence we have is that the Delta variant is rapidly displacing the Beta variant, which has been dominant in our country until now. We are concerned about the rapid spread of this variant. Firstly, because it is more transmissible than previously circulating viruses meaning that it is easier to catch this virus through person-to-person -person contact. It is thought to be twice as contagious, that is transmissible, as the earlier variants. Secondly, because it is more contagious, it can infect far more people. South Africa is currently gripped by a third COVID-19 wave. Some of the restrictions reimposed by the government include a total ban on alcohol sales. Our ministerial advisory committee has advised that the limited restrictions that we previously imposed were not that effective and that a prohibition will ease the pressure that is placed on hospital services by alcohol-related emergency incidents. In addition to the alcohol ban, all restaurants have been ordered to close. They may only provide takeaway meals and deliveries. Curfew has been extended. It will now be from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. All indoor and outdoor gatherings are prohibited and travel in and out of Gauteng province is also prohibited for leisure purposes. Gauteng is the worst affected province. Gauteng now accounts for more than 60% of new cases in the country. With the exceptions of the Northern Cape and the Free State, infections are rising rapidly in all other provinces. What we are seeing is that the existing containment measures in place are not enough, are not enough to cope with the speed and the scale of the infections. The impact of these interventions will be assessed in 14 days to determine whether they should be maintained or adjusted. Meanwhile, the president also announced that nearly 2.7 million people in South Africa have received a vaccine dose thus far. Yuli Sanjamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Egypt has announced new cuts to electricity subsidies, raising prices by between 8% and 26% from July. The move is part of a wider decision taken to eliminate state subsidies within five years in 2014, but which has since been extended to eight years following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Sajitian Yasser Hakim has the story. Electricity bills in the North African state will from July rise by between 8 and 26% depending on the consumption segment as the government implements the eighth increase in power prices. The electricity price hikes are part of a plan to gradually eliminate energy subsidies by 2019, but which has now been extended to 2024-2025. The move has faced several obstacles in the past. The government's plan began in 2014 and the initial target was to completely eliminate electricity subsidies by 2019. 
But after the floating of the Egyptian pound, the Prime Minister and the President postponed the subsidy cuts to 2021 to soften the effects of the austerity measures. Then there was a setback caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which hit the economy in 2020 and had a major impact on people's lives. So the decision was to postpone it from the 2020-2021 fiscal year to 2024-2025. The government says it will be saving approximately $1.7 billion annually from the subsidy cuts. Money, it says, will go into services and social welfare programs for the poor. Meanwhile, commercial and industrial facilities will not see an increase in electricity costs in a bid to ensure Egypt remains an attractive destination for investments. The state has fixed prices of electricity for industries at 10 piastres. When you compare these to neighboring countries and other regions, and in other continents as well, it is the lowest price, just 10 piastres or half a cent per kilowatt. Officials are also encouraging Egyptians to replace electricity with the much cheaper natural gas in their homes and businesses to save on household expenses. Yes, Hakim, or CGTN, Cairo. Tanzanian President Samia Suluhu Hassan sees a future where cryptocurrency is part of the country's economy. She's told the country's financial chiefs to prepare for change. CGTN's Isaac Lukando has more. Cryptocurrency trader Kabenda Balete is relieved that his favorite activity is now recognized by the government. He says from 2016 when he started trading, at least $22 million have already been transacted in Tanzania. Cryptocurrency, he believes, has been life-changing for many young people in the country. If you tell them you have to be employed, they won't understand you because they know that they are getting something they want from cryptocurrency. So there's a lot of benefits, but if you take time and learn, if you don't want to learn, then you lose money. While the exact number of cryptocurrency traders in the country is unknown, some estimate it could be in the thousands. The country's president is asking financial experts to explore the potential benefits and pitfalls of cryptocurrency. It's important that we work on these developments. We must be ready. When these changes come, they should not catch us off guard because we might feel we are not ready, but we may very well be overtaken by our own citizens. The adoption of blockchain technology, the platform on which cryptocurrencies are traded, is on the rise globally. What makes the technology attractive is its perceived safety, enabling individuals and businesses to carry out digital transactions on a secure platform at a much faster rate. Africa is the second continent globally in terms of cryptocurrency adoption, particularly in peer-to-peer -peer trading. Lack of access to traditional banking systems has made it easier for people in Africa to accept mobile money and now cryptocurrencies. While no regulation on cryptocurrency exists, the Central Bank of Tanzania says it has already begun working on it. Sandra Chogo, author and developer of a blockchain technology curriculum for Tanzania's public accountants, says with over 4,000 cryptocurrencies in existence, regulation is a must. There are some fake cryptocurrencies out there. You might think you've bought into a good one and expect it to increase in value, but it could turn out to be fake. Many end up losing even the capital they've invested. Tanzania adopting cryptocurrency as legal tender in the purchase of goods and services may be a long way off. In the meantime, the government is hoping to lay the foundation for smooth transactions in the future. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Many businesses in Nigeria are suffering from the impact of the UAA's travel ban. The ban came barely 48 hours after Emirates announced the resumption of flights to the West African nation. Disagreements between the UAE and the Nigerian government over COVID-19 protocols led to the renewed travel ban. Sijitian's Kelechia Mekalam has the details. Ijoma Makpai has spent about 10 years running and growing her interior design business. She sources her goods from Dubai and sells them in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. But the travel ban on Nigeria has been affecting her business. She's lost over 30% profit she could have made on turnovers. That is really, really affecting the business. You know, you don't get what you want because you can't travel. You have a business money, you're keeping it, waiting for, um, 
for a ban to be lifted. UAE flag carrier airline Emirates shut down flights to Nigeria since February due to government's disagreements on COVID-19 protocols. The UAE had announced plans to lift the travel ban only to rescind its decision 48 hours later. Experts blame the latest action on the absence of global leadership for pandemic protocols. We have our own protocol in Nigeria, uh, which is different from what they expected from us. So normally, it's supposed to be either the International Civil Vision Organization, like GAO, that's supposed to come with a protocol for all the uh, members uh, you know, to adhere to. So that is missing. The city is w, uh, uh, WHO. You know, they don't have a protocol for every country. And that is why countries like Britain just came out who can travel, cannot travel. In 2018, 185,000 Nigerians visited Dubai. But by the first half of 2019, Dubai recorded a 28% increase in the number of Nigerian visitors, bringing the West African nation to Dubai's top 20 visitors list. The travel ban has created a huge gap in the aviation industry and the larger economy. On the economy, uh, well, we are practically importers. So we, we import from Dubai. And Dubai uh, lives on our own, uh, you know, what we spend in Dubai. Because anytime uh, Nigerians travel to Dubai, they have to spend money. I won't say Dubai cannot do without our money. Uh, they can, but we have a lot of investment in Dubai too. So uh, we are linked economically. So it must have been, there must have been some impact on, on the two economies. There's no official statement from the Nigerian government on the travel ban extension, but businesses like Mapais are looking to resume transaction so they can maximize profit. They're hoping that both governments resolve their differences soon and reinstate the flights. Kelechi Emekalam, CGT in Abuja, Nigeria. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Uh. Oh. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Africa Live. Now for parents in low income areas in Kenya, accessing therapy and rehabilitation for children with special needs can be an uphill task. One charitable organization is seeking to address this by providing therapy in low income neighborhoods in the capital Nairobi. Every week on Saturday, children with autism, cerebral palsy, delayed milestones and other special needs assemble at centers where they have a one on one se or one on one sessions with specialists. So GTN reports. Every Saturday morning in a little room in Magare informal settlement in Nairobi, therapists knead and squeeze and massage their little patients until there is no more discomfort. It is an important part of the treatment. The Ready Aiders Foundation, a non-governmental organization, offers free therapy to children with special needs. Parents from across the city begin to arrive with their children from as early as 6.30 in the morning. They do not want to miss their turn with the two volunteer occupational therapists on duty. Christine started to attend the sessions after her daughter was diagnosed with autism. I noticed when she was three that she didn't speak and wasn't as active as the other children were. She tried the local hospital first, but faced a long wait for an appointment for therapy. So when she heard about the center in Madari, she traveled across town to take her child to it. Now when a song comes on the radio, I hear her sing along. She wasn't like that before. She'd spend the whole day without saying a word. 
Kristen is one of over 30 patients who bring their children to weekly sessions at this center. The therapy offered varies from child to child. We start by doing an assessment. Well, we, we do an assessment to identify the problems which the kid may have. After that, we make out a treatment plan which guides us on how to do the therapies. The center sees children with conditions like cerebral palsy, autism, Down syndrome, and others. We found out that children were the most disadvantaged when it comes to access of therapy services are expensive and hard to come by. Information regarding the nature, availability and distribution of rehabilitation services for children with disabilities in the country is scarce. However, the Action Foundation reports that even before COVID-19, access to rehabilitation services for children with disabilities was a challenge for parents and caregivers in informal settlements. This is a lifelong journey that you'll have to walk with them. So the therapy services that we offer these children make them become independent. They are not meant to cure the disability, but to make this child be able to go to school, uh, stay at home alone, because now for the parents who have children who have these disabilities, it means that they are tied to the houses. The foundation runs two other centers and plans to expand its operations to provide daily services. Every session enables the children and their parents to make another step forward, another step toward progress. In low-income neighborhoods across the country, accessing therapy for children with disabilities still remains an uphill task. Part of the challenge lies in lack of access and lack of awareness. Programs such as this, therefore, provide a platform for these children to access much-needed therapy, improving their outcomes. Bulkisanyabwa CGTN in Madari, Kenya. And coming up in sports.